Hey everybody, welcome back to the Logos Project. This is your host Dom. In uh, today's episode, um, although it's the second one of the day, I thought I'd uh, change topics because we've been doing a lot about church politics, um, traditionalism, progressivism, modernism, all that stuff. And uh, I thought I'd change things up so that we can get a little more level-headed here. And also, so I just want to make a point here for, uh, because I have in mind a larger audience than just catholics so i wanted to let catholics know that the stuff i do on church politics i'm sorry non-catholics i want to let you guys know that the stuff i do on church politics is for catholics so don't misunderstand i'm talking specifically with catholics in mind um so i think that's just an important thing to keep in mind when you go into those but now that we're changing topics thank god i'm going to be talking a little bit about um tolkien I'm going to be talking about his creation myth in um, the Silmarillion. And I got the book right here. I'm going to read a little excerpt from it and uh, comment on it a little bit and see how beautiful and fascinating it really is and make some interesting connections. Uh, that being said, um, of course, I got to give a plug. If you guys want to support this channel, um, I have the link for you. Now, before I show you, um, so if you notice on the top right, at least it's the top right for me, I and mean, it could be the left for you, there's a little uh, logo that says StreamYard, which is the, the service I use, the software. Now, if I am able to raise enough money, not only will we make better and more content, especially with um, my co-host Sam, those episodes seem to be very popular, and uh, as well as uh, other theologians and philosophers, but if I raise enough money, I can get rid of that little logo and uh, put ours instead, as well as um, get better uh, quality on the video. Because the camera, I have the camera, right? And it's it's top notch. But the device that is doing the live streaming, um, it, the quality will increase if I am able to purchase a plan. Now, the plans are pretty expensive. So long story short, um, if you want great content, support us at patreon.com slash the logos project. So thank you about that. And thank you to those who are already supporting us. And thank you to faithful listeners. Now, uh, don't worry, we will have Andrew on on a weekly basis uh, to continue that series. But now today, we're going to take a break. And we're going to look at Tolkien's creation myth from the Silmarillion. So <clears throat> it's called the I so I'm, it's hard to pronounce. It's hard to remember as well. Ainu Lindale. Um, it's the it's the music of the Ainur. So Ainur is what later will be called the Valar in the Silmarillion, which are kind of like angelic beings. So I'm just going to jump right into it, <clears throat> and I think you'll appreciate the beauty as well as the um, the theology uh, that Tolkien puts into his myth it's really quite amazing okay so it begins as follows there was eru the one who in arda is called iluvatar and he made first the enur the holy ones that were the offspring of his thought and they were with him before aught else was made and he spoke to them propounding to them themes of music and they sang before him and he was glad. But for a long while, they sang only each alone, or but few together, while the rest hearkened. For each comprehended only that part of the mind of Iluvatar from which he came, and in the understanding of their brethren, they grew but slowly. Yet ever as they listened, they came to deeper understanding and increased in unison and harmony. Okay, so that's the first paragraph. And the first time I read this, I was 11 years old, and I did not understand what I was reading. I mean, I guess I, I understood the surface of it, but I didn't realize at the time how packed this was with history and theology. Tolkien knows what he's doing. So the first thing I want to point out is that he calls Eru um, the one. Eru also called Iluvatar in Arda. Arda, you have to roll the R's. That's what the experts say. I'm trying to be faithful. Arda is basically Earth, right? So this is a creation myth written in retrospect, interestingly enough, right? By those who populate the Earth and speak of the origins of the world, of creation. And so Eru, called Iluvatar by, by the people of Arda, right? 
is called the one. Now, why is that significant? Well, it's significant because this is taken straight out of Neoplatonism, right? In Neoplatonism, the one was considered to be that principle of the good itself that is beyond being. So if you remember, I talked with uh, my co-host Sam uh, in our latest episode about one of the problems in Neoplatonic philosophy. It's not, it's not that it's a problem. It's, it hadn't um, been developed yet is this idea of analogical predication. So speaking in analogies, right? So when you speak in an analogy, you can say something about something else that is both similar and different. So... And the typical example that I used was ice cream is good. My wife is good. I'm not married, but my wife is good, right? Ice cream is good in a similar way as my wife is good. There's a goodness there, right? But it's not, you know, ice cream is not good in the same way my wife is good. If it was, that would be a problem. And so, in other words, when we speak of God, we, we don't say he's a being that has existence, but that he's existence itself. And so this analogical predication makes us capable of speaking of God as something that, not as something that exists, but as the act of existence, right? So in other words, we're the nouns, God is the verb, the ultimate pure to be verb, right? So he's completely other, but we can say analogically that he's something that exists. So that's both true and not, and not fully true because he isn't something, right, noun, that exists, verb. He's just a verb, but he exists, right? So anyway, hence the analogical predication. Now, the Neoplatonists didn't have that yet, but um, what they, so the, the way they saw it is that, and they got this from Plato, that he was the good beyond being. That was their way of saying how God is utterly, utterly other. But the, the problem with that, and St. Thomas resolves it with analogical predication, is that if something is beyond existence, well, it can't exist. Um, but there's still some truth there. So that's the tricky point. I hope that makes sense. So anyway, so you can see here, Tolkien is drawing from Neoplatonism uh, because the church fathers did. So uh, just a second here. What do we got? Okay, so the next thing that was interesting in that paragraph is that the holy ones, the Enur, which so Enur means the holy ones. I think it's... so. Again, I'm not a Tolkien expert. I did read this. So I, the first time I read it, I was 11. It was tough because this is not really a book for kids. <laughs> but um, if I'm not mistaken, Enur is Quenya, which is Old Elvish. Now, I could be completely wrong. Experts correct me in the comments. Now, they were offspring of his thought, of the thought of the one, right? So you're starting to see, again, the Neoplatonic uh, framework where you have the 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 logos of the one and then and then you finally have um am i mixing these up because i'm thinking noose yeah noose i think is the spirit so noose is that which is in the world that which gives life to the world logos is that which is in between noose and the one because it's like the pattern of intelligibility of all things and the one is the good beyond being as they would say and so here though what he's saying is it's it's kind of it's it's a pre-christian creation myth that's not anti-christian so a lot of what genesis exodus and you know the pentateuch and subsequent prophetic literature did is that they took um these other traditions right and they purged them of what was wrong and they kept the what, what the church fathers called the semina verbi which is latin for the seeds of the word and so what Tolkien is doing is he's going back and he's giving um, England, Britain, he's giving Britain a, a mythology of its own, but he's not giving it the pagan mythology that needed to be purged. Neither is he giving it the Christian mythology in light of the incarnation. He's giving it something that is before the incarnation, but not antithetical to it. Anyway, the point being is that here you have the idea of God's ideas, the divine ideas. But these are angelic beings for Tolkien. So this is kind of like a kind it's a version of henotheism where there are multiple gods, 
but there is only one that is the source of them all. So in the Holy Scriptures, what you have is a people who come out of pantheism and who through the Pentateuch adopt henotheism, which which um, it's very subtle. I mean, like even the henotheism of the Pentateuch is loaded with things that lead to monotheism. But monotheism really flourishes in the prophetic literature. And so I think this is what Tolkien is doing here. So, um, and finally, right, they they have, let's see, and he spoke to them, propounding to them themes of music. So here he's giving them a mission, right? And so the mission is to, so as thoughts of Eru, of the one, they they have a mission of pattern making, right? Of harmony, of beauty, um, of flowing, uh, of... Um, yeah, it's 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 the expression of the one outside of the one. So in Neoplatonism, you have the idea of emanation. Now, the Christianity would add that. So in Neoplatonism, emanation is seen as basically creation that emanates from the one. But it's seen as something like just it's necessary. It just kind of happens. Um, it flows out of uh, the one. But in Christianity, we say, no, creation is not necessary because it's free. God doesn't have to create, but he chooses freely to create so um okay so finally let's see yeah and there's this idea of them coming together in their pattern making and increasing in unison and harmony and the way they do that is you know so it says the last line here yet ever as they listened they came to deeper understanding and increased in unison and harmony and so there's an implication here that when they listened to the music of the other Enur, uh, Enur, right, then they would understand better. And then there was a union through that understanding, that relationship between the Enur that increased. And and so and this is where and he develops this, right? The theme of the grand music comes out of this. Okay, let's continue. Tolkien goes on. And it came to pass that Iruvatar called together all the Enur and declared to them a mighty theme. This is what I told you was, was going to happen. He declared to them a mighty theme, unfolding to them things greater and more wonderful than he had yet revealed. So there's a progressive revelation. It's interesting. And the glory of its beginning and the splendor of its end amazed the Enur, so that they bowed before Yeruvatar and were silent. I mean, the biblical themes are are all over the place, right? It's like in awe at the the not just the nature of the one, right? And, and you know, analogically speaking, uh, but also like his providence. And they and so this reminds me of when in Christian myth you talk about the angels seeing the incarnation. Um, although that's I don't think that's explicitly in scripture anywhere, but it might be deduced somehow. But it, I've always understood it to be Christian myth. But they see the incarnation. And they're in awe at what God's plan is. And also men, when they see angels or when they come upon holy ground or when they have a theophany, right? An encounter with God, usually silence, right? Being dumbstruck is the response. So this is kind of the idea here. So Tolkien continues. Then Iluvatar said to them, of the theme that I have declared to you, I will now uh, sorry, I will now that ye make in harmony together a great music. This is the great symphony I told you about. And since I have kindled you with the flame imperishable, ye shall show forth your powers in adorning this theme, each with his own thoughts and devices, if he will. But I will sit and hearken and be glad that through you great beauty has been wakened into song. So, again, the biblical themes are all over the place. So, what's interesting for the nerds, right, uh, the mention of the flame imperishable, Gandalf brings that up in um, in the Fellowship of the Ring when he faces off uh, the Balrog. And he says that he is a servant of the, I can't remember the quote verbatim, but I think he said servant of the secret fire. Um, and it's basically the, the idea of the secret fire uh, so he says, I have kindled you with the secret fire. So with the flame imperishable, I think it's a reference to life. Um, and it's because he continues, ye shall show forth your powers in adorning this theme. So here you have this idea of the intermediate 
excuse me, intermediate role of angels in providence, right? Um, and how like, so it's basically, it's a pagan idea that was Christianized because we, we moved on to henotheism, uh, to monotheism and realizing that angels aren't gods, but um, what, what the Bible would call them sons of God, right? Um, but there really is an intermediate idea here, which is why Christ as the son of God, although consubstantial with the father, but also fully human in the incarnation, uh, he really becomes the revelation of the father. So he's kind of like a message. He's the word of the father. And what that means is that he's not just a messenger, but a message, right? And in Greek, angelos, you know, is what we call angels. And so the point being is that he's the firstborn of creation and he stoops down and becomes human and then elevates our humanity above even that of the angels. So you have this really cool cosmic uh, coming forth from God and going back to God. This is the way St. Thomas's Summa is structured, right? You call it the exitus and the reditus. St. Thomas begins with God, his existence, right, in the life of the Trinity. And then he moves out to creation, to man, to the fall, and then to um, the incarnation, which initiates the return of man through this, the church and the sacraments back to the life of the Trinity. Man is incorporated back into the life of God. So, okay. Um, yeah, and it also says here, Iluvatar says, or Eru, I will sit and hearken and be glad that through you great beauty has been awakened into song into song so right god god rested and saw that it was good kind of thing right uh, but it's interesting that he speaks of it of of what they're doing as song so there's this idea that creation is a melody this comes up in ratzinger a lot it also comes up in in uh, louis bouillet who is a um amazing scholar of the uh, 20th century and a liturgical scholar and he even bouillet uh so i'm taking liturgy next semester and there's a passage in one of his books where it sounds a lot like this creation myth from Tolkien. In fact, we knew Tolkien. They they uh they had spent some time together. So that's that's really interesting. Okay, so I'm not gonna read the whole thing here. This is just a small episode, but I'm gonna read a little more. Tolkien continues. Then the voices of the Enur, like unto harps and lutes, and pipes and trumpets, and vials and organs, and like unto countless choirs singing with words, began to fashion the theme of Iluvatar to a great music. And a sound arose of endless interchanging melodies, woven in harmony, that passed beyond hearing into the depths and into the heights, and the places of the dwelling of Iluvatar, were filled to overflowing, and the music and the echo of the music went out into the void, and it was not void. It's just amazing, and the poetry is really awesome. And you hear the rhythm. Uh, he's trying to mimic the music here, right? Like unto harps and lutes and pipes and trumpets and vials and organs, and like unto countless choirs singing with words, began to fashion the theme of Iluvatar to a great music. And... Um, and then he continues, well, so first I want to point out, right, the pattern, the intelligibility of being fills the void and it's no longer void, right? Here you have the opposites of existence and nothingness, and it's basically God creates. Um, and he also imbues his creatures with causal power as well. And this is huge for Tolkien because for him language, right, is, is well, it's, it's God creates through the word, Right. But he believed that we were kind of sub creators. And that's why he created this entire world, because we had this capacity to create uh, sub worlds through our language, which is very, very interesting, especially if you think about um, how we construct our understanding. I mean, think of Adam naming the animals. Right. I mean, this is a huge theme throughout Christianity is, uh, you know, our capacity to uh, name things and, and, and how things can't really be what they are without the relationship of us to them. The kind of, this is the kind of dynamic of consciousness. And you want to be careful. You don't want to go all Kantian and say that nothing is real unless, and that you construct the world completely. Like there is real ontological um, creatures and beings and things out there 
that we do discover. But there's an interesting relationship to the conscien consciousness of man that's uh, that especially phenomenologists explore, and that you you see this in uh, if anyone's interested, um, what's his name, Robert Sokolowski, great Catholic uh, uh, philosopher who talks a lot about this. Um, John Paul II a little bit, but he's more he deals more with uh, um, he's trying to synthesize Saint Thomas with. Uh, um, uh, Max Shaler, who is, uh, I guess you could call him a phenomenologist. Yeah, he, I'm pretty sure he's a phenomenologist. But anyway, the point being is that there's some Catholics working on that, on all that stuff, and it's fascinating, beautiful, and awesome. In fact, I have an episode on it. Uh, check it out. It's called, I think it's called Metaphysics and Phenomenology or Phenomenology and Being. I think it's called Phenomenology and Being. Check out that episode. Okay. Uh, all right. Con Tolkien continues Never since have the Ainur made any music like to this music. Though it has been said that a greater still shall be made before Iluvatar by the choirs of the Enur and the children of Iluvatar after the end of days. I mean, that's the theme of new creation. I mean, Tolkien is just, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he knows his theology, basically. Um, let's see. Then the themes of Iluvatar shall be played aright and take being in the moment of their utterance. Isn't that interesting? It's through the word that things take on being. For all shall then understand fully his intent in their part, and each shall know the comprehension of each, and Iluvatar shall give to their thoughts the secret fire, being well pleased. So you actually kind of get a, a glimpse into how Tolkien understands magic here uh, in his world, which is that magic for Tolkien, it's really the creative power of language. Um, and it's also, it, it's never done uh, in disharmony from the the themes that Iluvatar delegates to the Enur, right? Uh, when it does go, when it is in disharmony, it's when Morgoth, as we'll see probably in a different episode, but when Morgoth starts to, um, well, Merkor is what they call him uh, at first. Morgoth is, I think, what he's called, an Arda. <laughs> so this is really nerdy stuff for you Tolkien lovers. But, uh, yeah, he basically, that's what witchcraft is for Tolkien. So uh, this is much richer than Harry Potter, which is much more um, naturalistic um, and lacks the kind of transcendence you find here, which is why Tolkien will always be the best no matter what. But, <laughs> um, yeah, witchcraft is... It's like an anti-creation kind of. It's 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 destroying the pattern of intelligibility the, and the the pattern and the intelligibility of being, and uh, that's what Merkor does eventually. He introduces that chaos. So I'll end with this last paragraph, and it introduces Merkor, and I, I I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. I just know you have to roll the R's. That you know that's what Tolkien would have wanted. So last paragraph. Let's see. I hope the mic is good. Let's put it like right here. Okay, Tolkien goes on. But now Iluvatar sat and hearkened, and for a great while it seemed good to him, for in the music there were no flaws. But as the theme progressed, it came into the heart of Melkor to interweave matters of his own imagining. So think of the turn towards the self, right? Of his own imagining that were not in accord with the theme of Iluvatar. For he sought therein to increase the power and glory of the part assigned to himself. So remember St. Augustine's phrase, incurvatus in se, in Latin, which is like kind of turned in towards the self. So this is exactly what Tolkien's tapping into. He continues, To Melkor, among the Enur, had been given the greatest gifts of power and knowledge, and he had a share in all the gifts of his brethren. He had gone often alone into the void places, seeking the imperishable flame. That's just fascinating. Melkor goes into the void to seek what can only be found in the harmony of Iluvatar, right? <laughs> it's the paradox of man trying to be God. But this, so, but here it's applied to the angels, interestingly enough, um, because you do have in the Christian uh, uh, legends that there's a parallel between the, the sin of the angels and the sin of uh, of man but anyway he goes into the void to seek the imperishable flame but it can only be a, a gift as Tolkien insinuates here 
And he continues, Tolkien continues, For desire grew hot within him to bring into being things of his own. And it seemed to him that Iluvatar took no thought for the void, and he was impatient of its emptiness. So there's a search for power in Melkor. He wants to, he wants to shape, to control, right? Uh, as opposed to receive and to uh, till and to keep, right? And to have dominion versus uh, to have possession that is merely for the self, right? In curvatu sinse. Um, where was I? Tolkien continues, Yet he found not the fire, for it is with Iluvatar, right? But being alone, he had begun to conceive thoughts of his own, unlike those of his brethren. All right. So that's just to show you uh, the profundity of Tolkien's writing. This is a bunch of stuff I just never, never understood when I re read it for the first time. I was like, okay, this sounds kind of like the Bible, I guess. Um, and, you know, and at that time, I probably thought the Bible was boring as well. And uh, now here I am completely fascinated with it. So, Bible. Uh, this is not scripture, right? <laughs> Tolkien is not scripture. It's, it's, um, it's him expressing his understanding of catholic theology and and of history and and really of the world and in doing so in fiction and that's why it's beautiful so fiction can also be a means of of theologizing really and so i mean i mean that's pretty much what tolkien does throughout so okay so this is probably a good place to stop um if there's any questions let me know i'll stick around for just a bit um but i just wanted to say that um we're not going to do just churchy politics stuff, I promise, because that can get really tedious. Um, but it is, I'm doing it for the purpose of um, hopefully helping others uh, who have questions and people who are confused uh, and just, you know, studying more to be able to provide those answers. But also, like, this show is targeted at a wide audience, and so we want to talk about cultural phenomena film franchises, literary works, you know, um, maybe we'll, we'll get into politics when I've done a little bit more research in that area. And, uh, but just to show how theology informs all of that, whether, whether we know it or not, this is often something I tell my co-host Sam is that the secular doesn't exist. It's just a different religion, right? In other words, paganism, really, there's no such thing as secular. It's a, it's a construct in our mind that doesn't fit with reality. And I mean, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I would say go back and listen to some of our episodes. Um, but actually, we'll probably have to do an episode on the secular. Um, maybe I could get a scholar on. That would be interesting. So, okay. So, yeah, without further ado, um, looks like there's no questions. It is late, and I kind of did this impromptu. Um, thanks for listening. Oh, we got a question here. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Sam. What's up, man? What is the draw to Tolkien for people who don't understand the theological bedrock? Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. Well, first of all, it's the comprehensiveness of the world he created. For, well, that's not where they. That's not what they discover first. What they discover first is the Lord of the Rings, or, or as as children, uh, younger children, the Hobbit. And what you have in The Hobbit really is just a story of uh, that unfolds that is filled with archetypal themes from ancient mythologies because Tolkien knows his mythologies. And so there's that archetypal draw. It's like, why do people like Harry Potter? Why do people like Star Wars? I would say it's the same same reason. So it's initially, it's like the archetypes in The Hobbit, I think, was the door because when he published that book, it became massively popular. Then um, when he published The Lord of the Rings, um, at first, people thought it wasn't going to be successful. It's like this weird fantasy world, make-believe thing. Adults don't read that kind of stuff back then, you know, because Tolkien is the father of modern fantasy. Before Tolkien, we didn't really have uh, – I'm sure, I'm sure there's exceptions, but we didn't really have modern fantasy the way we have it today. But the reason that The Lord of the Rings worked is because you could tell it was a story that was resting on top of an iceberg, in other words, it was the tip of the iceberg, and it was a really cool story up there, but you could tell there was all of this stuff beneath it that he just would hint at, but you could tell there's stuff he's not telling us.
there's more that's in his mind, and I want to know what's in his mind. So at the end of the day, I would say the initial draw to Tolkien is with the Hobbit and the hero's journey that's therein, very appealing to children and even adults. But then when the Lord of the Rings came out, it, it became more serious, more dark, and more mature. But also it, it never lost its like innocence, beauty, its focus on hope, uh, its focus on the theme of death as well. Um, and grace and and really it became like a a kind of subconscious commentary on the gospel and like people don't know this because you know as Jordan Peterson says the gospel is um, it's it's basically a, a, an amazing archetypal story of psychological significance obviously as Catholics we believe it's more than that because it's historical right the word was made flesh the archetype was a person a real person. Um, but yeah, that's why Tolkien was so popular. It really spoke to the um, the yeah the the longings, the the patterns of the human uh, consciousness, sub subconscious, you might say, of of culture. And finally, I mean, and then when when that uh, book was like exploded, the Lord of the Rings, we discovered when the Silmarillion was published posthumously after he died, that yes, in fact, there was this massive iceberg underneath. And it was absolutely massive. In fact, it's unprecedented in literature as far as I as far as we have any records of. No one's done what Tolkien has done. So he's a colossal genius who invented this massive world. So I hope that makes sense. That's basically why is Tolkien interesting. Uh, and for the Catholic or even the the you might say the high church Protestant. I mean, even the low church Protestant, but it's just Tolkien is so Catholic that, you know, a lower church Protestant would probably be very uncomfortable with some of it. But um, especially for the Catholic, you know, it's when you start to see what he's doing theologically, that that adds layers and it makes it all the more delightful. So that's why Tolkien is a genius. And he's not just a fiction writer. I really believe he's a he's a theologian through his fiction. Um, and this might be overplaying my hand, but he's kind of a mystic. <laughs> Because he has this understanding of the world that is enchanted, right? Which is exactly what we just read. So, yeah, that's why. So, thanks for the question, Sam. Thanks for helping me out here. And uh, that being said, that's a good 30-minute video. Um, in other words, read Tolkien. Uh, even if, like, some of the theology kind of goes over your head, uh, you can't really kind of decipher it. It still, like I said, talks to... Um, it talks to your your subconscious, uh, the patterns of creation, right? The the language that is imbued. Of the right? creation is the thought of God in a certain sense, and so uh, that's why Tolkien is amazing. So yeah, so support us at Patreon.com/slash The Logos Project. Thank you everybody for being faithful listeners. Uh, thank you to our Patreon supporters, our Patreon supporters. Without you, we couldn't do any of this. Um, and so, without further ado, we'll see you guys next time.